everyone and welcome back to the Sedona International Film Festival for our silver anniversary. We are coming to you live from the Sedona Rouge Hotel and Spa, who is one of our sponsors, as well as Digitech and Black Magic Design. And joining me now is Elsa and Richard with the film Playing With Fire. Welcome. Thank you. And I understand, Elsa, so you're not a stranger to this part of the country. No, I have a very dear connection to Sedona. My daughter, who's now 35, is an environmental scientist, went to Verde Valley School and had a wonderful experience. And since then, Kauai, where I live, has a beautiful community of people. And we kind of have a sister community here on uh, in Sedona. So we cross-pollinate all the time. I think that's interesting. You just, you know, not to get off track at mm -hmm. all, but Kauai is very similar to the energy, I guess, that Absolutely. people talk about of Sedona. They call us sister um, cities, Kauai and Sedona. Same red earth. Yeah, that's awesome. I think in Asheville, North Carolina, it's the yeah, same. As well. So it's the three, the tri, yeah. tri cities. Tri yeah, <laughs> as well. So tell us a little bit about your film. The film is uh, based on the life and work of my late husband, Carlos Almaraz, who was a beloved artist in the Los Angeles area and throughout the Southwest. And an incredible story of. Um, the parts that people don't know of his persona, he in LA he was very well known as the leader of the Chicano art movement and later went into a studio to create 10 years of the work that we now know and love. I and mean, he was incredibly prolific. But what people didn't know about him, because his public persona is very much in the press all the time, and he was articulate and charming and um, seemed to be very optimistic. But he had a very dark side that, uh, and demons sort of plagued him his entire life. And we're telling that part of the story as well. So being married to an artist, um, you know, I, I've interviewed a lot of artists um, throughout my whole entire career, and it's something that's really important to me. I love mm -hmm. art, and I love talking with artists. Um, and, you know, some use art as an escape, and others um, use it just really, I mean, they don't. It's just they're portraying something in, whether it's nature or however, but the process of how they get into it mm -hmm. is something that, from what they've said to me or have explained to me, it's almost like either a a portal that they go through that enters into another time mm -hmm. dimension and place so they're able to do their work so knowing you know that about him and you just sort of said that mm -hmm. but um, did you notice like a lot of times when he went into that role of the painting did you find oh that? absolutely I mean, we shared a studio I'm a painter as well okay. and we met doing political work uh, in the cultural renaissance in Los Angeles the, the Chicano art movement and when we both went into our studios we did personalized work and we both accessed that channel of sort of outside of yourself where information and inspiration comes through and often you're not even aware of it. It goes onto the canvas and you step back and you're like, wow, that's exactly what I was feeling. And um, so yeah, it's, it's a really beautiful connection to have that. Mm -hmm. And Richard, your role in the film? Um, the editor of the documentary mm -hmm. and co-producer. Yeah. Now, did you two know each other prior to uh, getting together on this film? No, we did not. No, it was uh, the executive producer that sort of put us together, and we just kind of created this really great bond, mm -hmm. and, and um, I think it shows in the work. I mean, a, 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 a slight anecdote is we were having trouble with the, with the documentary for a while, and Elsa invited me to go to Kauai where they lived together for a long time. And I really think that at the end, to go there and to sort of edit mm. and finish this documentary in that environment, I think the spirit of Carlos like sort of guided us, you know, into the sort of goal line at the end. Yeah, he orchestrates everything still. <laughs> <laughs> he was very spiritual. I'm still working for him. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so we've got a great synergy and in, in, in work relation uh, with the film. It's mm -hmm. been beautiful. Thank you yes. for all your hard work. Okay. Yeah, it's been incredible. Awesome. How important is it um, as an editor um, and your role in telling the story of a film? I, I mean, it, it's so difficult in something like this to sort of distill somebody's life into like 80 minutes. I mean, there's just so much that's left out. And I think that was just the hardest part. And But to have, you know, his widow to guide as the director was just, I mean, she knew insight that nobody else would know. Nobody, nobody else could have made this film 
the way it turned out, except for Elsa. Now, was, was there any surprises for you in going through this film or learning about um, Carlos or the art or anything that you took away from this? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I'm Chicano also. I was born in San Diego, and I felt a kinship to his story. And, and it, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it was just an amazing experience. And Elsa's the, the true sort of guide for this. Well, I'm, I feel like I'm the wellspring because Carlos was so open in his life mm -hmm. that in the 10 years that we were married, um, he shared so much and he was very open with anyone. I mean, he wrote, he had 89 journals and, and we're, we're using excerpts from those journals to tell his story. So in essence, he's the narrator. Um, and we're using Zach de la Rocha, who's from Rage Against M Machine, who Carlos knew at, when Zach was a child because one of Carlos's art collectives, Los Four, Zach's dad was in Los Four, so um, Zach had a really heart connection to Carlos and just jumped in to do this. And the interesting thing is, Zach's, the timber in Zach's voice is very much like Carlos, so often people don't know if Carlos is talking or if Zach's talking. Yeah, we had to put little titles up. Yeah, <laughs> just to distinguish it between, because yeah. Oh and then we goodness. also had Edward James Olmos, mm -hmm. sort of our narrator. So we have these like three voices that kind of yeah. go through the, and Elsa's voice, obviously. Yeah. Was, Oh, awesome. You just mentioned um, that there were 80 or so journals yes. that your husband kept. So were those pretty much private journals and then you yes. sort of got an insight to it? They were private and although often you get a feeling that he knew that these would be public one day, the way he writes, the way he addresses not only himself, but it feels like he's addressing us. So yes. Um, um, they're out there, the Archives of American Art at the Smithsonian has a collection of all of the journals on microfiche. I, I'm still holding on to the actual books. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So how does that, I mean, you know, going into a personal space, like, you know, and reading stuff like that, was yeah. there anything that surprised you or took, you, took away or even gave you an understanding of who he was or the struggles that he was going through. Oh, absolutely. It started, his journal writing started when he was a young artist in New York in the 60s. And just, just tortured artist. He was grappling with his sexuality. He had been molested by an uncle and a priest when he was a child. So he was very confused and acting out all over New York. And in fact, later uh, in 1989, he died of AIDS. And that was from his bisexual encounters in New York City. Um, it was tragic because um, he was very open about his life and his sexuality. And so I willingly and knowingly married a bisexual man in the, in the time of AIDS, and it was beautiful. I would do those 10 years all over again. Um, but the journal writings were very deep and, and harsh and dark. He was very depressed during that time. He committed himself to Mount Sinai Mental Institute twice because he was having problems with not only his sexuality and the temperament of the art world, it was minimalist art at the time, and he's an imagist, but also with, um, uh, he was drinking very heavily because he was so unhappy. And it finally landed him at the LA County General Hospital with severe pancreatitis, uh, almost died, was in a coma for 40 days, uh, received last rites, went through the tunnel of white light, and actually encountered a spaceship that was traveling at the t same time zone as his heartbeat, very slow. And they took him on this incredible journey, which we feature in the film as well. But yeah, I learned a lot about him and his relationships through those journals. Um, interestingly enough, he stopped journaling as soon as he and I got together and he found some happiness. There was no need to journal. Wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bravo. Um, yeah. Were you with him when he um, when he passed? I had. I think spiritually, I was with him. We didn't know he was going to pass that night. There was no reason he was in the hospital to be fed because he was so thin. Uh, but he had no infection at the time, and I think he just chose to check out that night. But I was at home reading a, a book, preparing myself, uh, by Stephen Levine called Who Dies. And I was reading the meditations at the end of the book of the moment before death, the moment of death, and the moment after death, thinking I would like to, to read that to him during his transition. 
And apparently I did because I didn't find out till the next morning. They didn't couldn't find my phone number. It was very bizarre. Wow. wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for bringing this to life, mm -hmm. too. Um, you know, and thank you for your editing on this <laughs> piece, <so> <laughs> telling the story. Mm -hmm. um, where could we find out about the film? Um, well, let's see. We have a Carlos Almaraz fan page on Facebook. Uh, and then we have a um, website that's not yet up, but it'll be carlosalmaraz.com. We're hoping that it'll be up soon. And um, yeah, or notify us. We've got um, <laughs> Carlos Almaraz. <laughs> and um, your film is being shown when? Tomorrow at 1.15, I believe, yes. at the Mary Fisher. Okay. Please right. come and see it. Yes, awesome. Please. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. We'll do that. And make sure that wherever you are in Sedona and you're taking pictures within the film festival, you tag us. Absolutely. So you have to do hashtag Sedona Film Fest 25. Okay. 25. Yeah, and okay. everybody else who's out there, please make sure Sedona you... Sedona Film Fest? Film Fest. Okay. Yep, 25. Oh, great. Great. Yep. Thank you so right, much so for sure having us. Make sure you do that. And thank, uh, you. thank you so much. And we will be back with more from the Sedona International Film Festival after this.